Good evening and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Farooq Ahmed and I will today be in discussion with Dr. Parvez Hoodboy, whose new book is titled Pakistan Origins, Identity and Future. Uh, the book is available for purchase outside and Dr. Hoodboy will be avail available to sign your copy after the event. Uh, as a Pakistani American, it is a special pleasure to wel welcome back an old friend to San Francisco. A special welcome to all of you, including our online participants. The British colonized the Indian subcontinent for a century, and they finally left in 1947. That was also the year that the independent country of Pakistan was born. It was carved out of the Indian subcontinent for Muslims by the departing British in an event known as partition, which created India and Pakistan. Boundaries were hastily drawn by the departing British. Over 15 million otherwise ethnically similar people crossed from one side to the other on the basis of religion, and over a million were violently killed in the process. Pakistan today has a population of 240 million and a 2,000 mile border with India. Very few people cross this border today, and there is very little cross-border trade. Pakistan and India have fought four wars, and they have, been in, they have been in conflict ever since partition. More ominously, both countries have nuclear weapons. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Pervez Hoodboy to discuss his timely and powerfully written book titled Pakistan Origins, Identity, and Future, Dr. Hoodboy lives in Islamabad, Pakistan, where he has been a professor of physics for nearly 50 years. He received his PhD from MIT in nuclear physics in 1978 and is an internationally recognized public intellectual with a long list of accomplishments uh, and honors. In 2011, he was included among the 100 top global thinkers by Foreign Policy magazine. He is a promoter of science education and a strong advocate of free speech. He has a well-earned reputation for factually and objectively addressing tough and sensitive issues. His earlier book touched a delicate subject and was titled Islam and Science, Religious Orthodoxy and the, Ball the Battle for Rationality. So as you can see, he doesn't shy away from difficult subjects. Religion and nationalism have only grown in importance in recent years, not just in Pakistan, but also in India and the region. Pervez and I were both born in Pakistan uh, about three years after partition, though he's a year younger than I am. Uh, we overlapped as undergraduates at MIT. He returned to Pakistan, whereas I went on to Stanford University for my graduate degrees and then to a career in Silicon Valley as startup founder and investor. I went, went back to Pakistan for a visit three months ago, after a very long time, to reconnect with remaining relatives uh, while I was able and uh, fill in gaps in my family's history before partition. It was a memorable trip and I also left with an updated view of the situation in Pakistan. Today we will discuss Pakistan's history, its current situation, why India and Pakistan have diverged despite their common origins and prospects for the future. So Pervez, I read your book and words like logical, rational, well-researched came to mind. Uh, so I want to start with something emotional. Uh, you said fairly early in the book that you wrote the book because you were angry and uh, not only angry now, but you had been angry for a long time, and I assume you're still angry. So tell us what you're angry about uh, to get us started on the issues that we'll be discussing. Well, I'm angry because I was lied to about history. Of course, a lot of people everywhere in the world are told lies by their nation states. They're told to believe in certain myths and I too had absorbed those myths. So while you and I were in school, you might remember 1965, we were told that India had attacked Pakistan, <laughs> that it was an unprovoked attack, and that we were merely repelling it. But as I grew older, I knew there was a pack of lies. Hmm. 
mm-hmm. that in fact we in Pakistan in an effort to quote liberate Kashmir had sent our army across the border and hoped that the Kashmiris would rise up and uh, so get rid of the Indians. I didn't find this out until much later, until I actually met people in the army, in the air force, and uh, until I read books. So that's just one thing, but there has been taught to our children, to Pakistani children, a set of lies which creates a national narrative that is flawed in so many ways that I felt that really it is now time to set the record straight. And so this is the book that you're referring to is a very uh, modest effort at trying to do that. And uh, it begins from way before Islam came into existence. Then it comes to the Muslim invasion. And then it comes to how Hindus and Muslims who were very similar and who uh, were difficult to differentiate in times that go back to of several hundred years, I mean eight, nine hundred years. Thereafter, that difference grew just a little bit more, but it was with the coming of the British that the differences really grew. Mm-hmm. 1870 was the first census that was carried out on the Indian subcontinent. And you had to declare whether you were Hindu or Muslim. That would determine your employment opportunities. Mm. And uh, well, that set in place a whole set of uh, events. And uh, the, the, the gap which had been a, just a tiny crack, it grew into a chasm. Comes 1947, which is when Pakistan was formed, and um, that was huge. <laughs> so if we want to talk about divergent trajectories, mm-hmm. you have to look at the history over a long period of time. So on that, on that point, uh, I think all of us have seen the newspapers these days. And Pakistan is currently in a state of crisis, uh, both economic and political. If you were to give a quick summary of what history has to do with the current crisis, what led to this? What are the roots of it? What are the fundamental issues around partition that made this crisis, I wouldn't say inevitable, but certainly easier to explain? In a nutshell, Pakistan today is bankrupt. Mm-hmm. It, is op- it is asking the IMF for a loan of $1.1 billion, which is a trivial amount. But uh, even in that, it is having difficulties. The, the problem is that basically the consumption is very high, the production is very low, and the people who are Pakistanis overseas who are sending money back, they are great in numbers, but they're very poorly they're very poorly situated in terms of their skills. Mm-hmm. And so if you were to ask me what is the fundamental problem, it is that our people have an insufficient skill set. They have been insufficiently educated. And that goes back to the very beginnings of Pakistan because Pakistan was created as, as um, uh, on the basis of religious identity. If you're Muslim, you go here. If you're Hindu, you go there. And as it turned out, Muslims, because of reasons that I go into in detail in the book, Mm -hmm. had um, not got into the mainstream of modernity, of science, Mm -hmm. of technology, and uh, the the reasons I can come to later if people are interested. Mm -hmm. But that means that 1947, we had a bad beginning. Mm -hmm. It could have been fixed. I don't believe that, uh, you know, what is in the past entirely determines your future because after all, we do have agency. And so in the first years of Pakistan, things seemed to be going well, but then um, because of a certain mindset, we didn't develop ourselves. 
and it all, could all be done because we were uh, instruments of uh, we let ourselves become the instruments of American foreign policy we were aligned with uh, the US as it was in combat with the Soviet Union during the Cold War now that interest went to zero after the Taliban took over Afghanistan so basically the the current crisis comes from the fact that the United States has entirely lost interest in Pakistan and the Chinese who have come to fill the, the, the empty space are uh, not too interested in bailing out Pakistan. They don't want to step into America's shoes and hence the crisis. So you describe in vivid detail at Pakistan's beginning the role of the feudal class, the military, the elite, uh, and other big institutionally anchored communities that essentially may explain some of what you're discussing in terms of what didn't happen. Because other countries get a start that's not perfect, but there's a self-correcting process uh, that, that can be kicked off. So that, you know, you get a bad start, but uh, then you fix it. So that, why didn't that happen in, in, in Pakistan? So, as you say, it could have happened. And in fact, I would say the first years of Pakistan, the first uh, couple of decades, looked as if we're making up for deficiencies of the past. But then, um, because of this alignment with the United States, mm. the fact that uh, more weapons than other things were given to mm. us, there was a reinforcement of the warrior mindset. Mm -hmm. The Pakistan army had basically uh, taken over the, the, the politics and the direction of the country. So we had our first war with India in 1947. This is just months after the new nation had been formed. Then the next war comes in 1965, which I had basically, which I had referred to earlier. Well, 1971 was another war, but this was not a war of choice. But 1999, in the mountains of Kargil, that was a war of choice. And it was basically because here is a big military. It's an enormous military with a huge number of privileges and which, as you won't believe it, sugar factories, cement factories, they run transportation, they have banks. They even run beauty parlors, do you know? So, well, that's not so, the job for an army now to keep that position. They have to be at war all the time. Okay. So essentially, it's, it's as sometimes said, Pakistan is a country, a military has a country rather than a country has a military. So let me step back. You mentioned that historically the British played a part in dividing Muslims and Hindus for their own purposes and that this process accelerated towards the 1947 partition events. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it, it seems that even shortly before 1947, Muslims and Hindus were actually in some communities living in relative harmony. So I'd mentioned to you earlier that my grandfather was Home Minister and Chief Judge in the state of Jammu and Kashmir in the 1920s. And there was a Hindu Maharaja and they got along very well. Uh, and then 10 years later, you know, we had the movement towards Pakistan and, and so forth. So this, this apparently accelerated. How did that happen? What were the techniques and why? And specifically, you talk of Jinnah as more of a politician than a statesman. And I think, think it would be helpful to position him because he is generally considered to be the father of Pakistan. That's too much in, <laughs> for one question. <laughs> what we need to do is go back mm -hmm. in history. So let's go back to the time of the Mughal Empire. So that's uh, uh, something like beginning 500 years ago, last 350 mm -hmm. years. It's a grand period for India in the sense that the most beautiful architecture is created then. There, there's music, poetry, but uh, the now that was a time when it was Muslim rule over India and yet it was one where um, Hindus weren't, weren't 
persecuted in the sense that they were they weren't shut they weren't shut out they weren't stomped upon in fact some of the biggest the most important generals in the mughal a armies were hindus mm -hmm. and there was a lot of cross marriage in fact there is no mughal empire uh, emperor who is a pure muslim they're all uh, progeny of um, previous emperors who had married into hindus into rajputs in particular but of course there was a cultural difference in the sense that the muslims were more interested in administration they were they liked um, music and they liked hunting they weren't particularly interested in keeping accounts and that was what the hindus were doing and the hindus were doing business mm -hmm. so well communities do have their particular strengths mm -hmm. and so these two strengths mm -hmm. were separate then come the british uh, 250 years ago slowly slowly they take over india they ruled india for 250 years or 200 years you could say because it didn't have a definite starting date but they needed locals to run their administration at the very peak, there were no more than 50,000 white men, white Britishers on the Indian subcontinent, whereas there were something like 300 million Indians. So you need somebody, you need a, a class of people mm -hmm. who will be capable of, of administration. So obviously they must know English. And divide and conquer too. Mm -hmm. Well, that comes in too, and you're right about that, mm. but they need, People who can think like them mm -hmm. are modern-minded. Mm. And so there was, of course, self-interest. Mm. But there was also a kind of desire, because you see, the British were the consequences of the Enlightenment. Imperialism actually came from the great ideas, the great ferment that was there after the Renaissance, after the and the Enlightenment, which includes the scientific mm -hmm. revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And so they wanted to implant that mm -hmm. in Britain as well. Mm -hmm. After all, who would run the railways? Mm -hmm. uh, you need technical people for that. You need engineers, mm -hmm. you need lawyers and all that. Now, here is where the difference came about, because when um, Lord Macaulay in, 19, in 1835 said, we're not going to support any traditional schools, we're only going to support those which teach modern subjects. Well, the Hindus said um, they weren't fully enthusiastic, mm. but more of them said yes. And some said more schools, more colleges, and give us a university. But there was a lot of hubris on the Muslim side who said, no, we have the word of God with us. We don't need your education. And so mm, that was the beginning of a growing gap, which grew and grew. And as I said, that was what we inherited at the time of partition. So, so let's talk about religious nationalism. And that's a good segue. Uh, because as you're pointing out, uh, uh, several Muslims, the Muslim communities essentially reacted the way you're describing, and today we find the gap increasing. Uh, there is Islamic fundamentalism in Pakistan, and there is increasingly Hindu fundamentalism in India. And your first book was on the subject of Islam and science, which essentially talked about this growing gap. Uh, how is how would you describe uh, fundamentalism in both these religions? Are they similar? Uh, what is what's going on? Since you're referring to my first book, I've, I've got to explain a little bit about it because I've been profoundly upset by the fact that Muslims had a grand past. After all, between the 9th and the 13th centuries, they were the only ones who were doing science, philosophy, astronomy, medicine. Those were the dark ages of Europe. So how come those four to five hundred years of, enlight of, of, um, of great work mm -hmm somehow disappeared and then for the last um, eight nine hundred years we don't see anything which is produced by muslims after all it's not electricity mm. or 
antibiotics or computers or whatever, mm, they disappeared. So what's the reason for that? So my first book was about that, and mm. it has a bearing on today's present as well. Mm. The reason science prospered in Islam mm. was because of the because of Muslims encountering Greek works. Mm -hmm. So as Islam, after 638, expanded, it came upon these treasures of Greek learning. And the first part of the uh, change was translation. The second part was improving on the translations and doing new things. And so a lot of new stuff came along. Consider algorithm. Everybody here in Silicon Valley uses algorithms. Algorithm is a word invented by Al-Khwarizmi of uh, a thousand years ago. Now that ultimately died out because there was earlier an openness. Mm -hmm. So in the courts of the caliphs who were not just political people, they were also people of intellect and their invited to the courts would be Jews and Christians and Nestorians and all that. But uh, ultimately this came to a stop. And when it came to a stop, the decline began. So let's talk about that for a moment, because when we were growing up in Pakistan, uh, our classmates included, uh, you know, Hindus and Christians and Jews and even Chinese, Pakistanis. And now, and I went back, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, a few months ago, pardon me, and, and you know, there's nobody there. There are no minorities. What happened in the last 75 years uh, that changed the situation there? So here is the difference between India, mm. secular initially, mm -hmm. under Jawaharlal Nehru, who was committed to the idea of a pluralist, secular India, and saw that as a way of acquiring modernity and of bringing prosperity to India. In the case of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was also by uh, personal habit, secular, but he had to use the religious slogan in, in order to create Pakistan. Well, the first 20 years were okay, and mm -hmm. so when uh, you and I were growing up over there, well, at least in my neighborhood, there were Christians uh, to the house over here, to the house over here. There were um, a couple of Hindus, mm -hmm. and we had Hindu friends, you mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, and there was even a Jew, mm -hmm. yes. a Jew in, and in fact, one of our teachers. Yes, hmm? yes. you remember? Her? I remember, and actually, Ismik. so yeah. I had a Jewish friend who came from Israel to Karachi in the 1970s. So something changed in 1970s, 1980s, that really, really made a huge difference. What what was that? Absolutely. So it. It came gradually. Mm. It, the religious minorities saw the writing on the wall, mm. but there wasn't anything, there was no pogrom as such. There was no uh, written policy as such. Mm. But then I think the big change came in 1974 when mm. Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, Prime Minister of Pakistan, made his step in declaring a particular set of people who were earlier Muslims declared them to be non-Muslims and thereafter they became the object of persecution and are the worst persecuted religious minority in Pakistan yeah. today. And as you pointed out, the definition of who is Muslim is, is also not entirely clear. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of dissension about that. Are Ahmadis Muslims? Some people say Shias aren't Muslims. So there's a lot of internal conflict going on. Um, so well, to this day, it has not been resolved as to who is a Muslim. And in fact, this issue came before the, before the court, which um, asked the religious leaders, define who is a Muslim. And not only was there no consensus, but there were diametrically opposite points of views on this. And so, so that's a puzzle even today. So let's talk about Hindu nationalism, which you describe in your book in vivid terms again. 
And, and so, so tell us about Hindu nationalism. What is it? Is it similar to Islamic nationalism or what's going on in Pakistan? And, and does it, what, what does it portend uh, for India? Groups have a natural propensity to project themselves as a collective whole. Mm -hmm. But if you go back far into the past, say 2,000 years ago, or no, better, 1,000 years ago, you find that uh, according to the researches of historians, the difference between Hindu and Muslim was very, was very um, difficult. They were, it was difficult to distinguish between them. If you had asked a person, who, uh, an ordinary person in some village, are you Hindu? He wouldn't have been known, he wouldn't have known how to answer the question because the word Hindu did not exist some 1,000, 1,200 years ago. In fact, the, the famous traveler, um, Al-Biruni, he, when he came from Arabia and he asked uh, around, he found that um, he, he calls both Hindus and Muslims Hindus. Why? Because the word comes from the Arabic word Al-Hind, which comes from Al-Sindh, and Sindh is the, is the river. So in other words, mm -hmm. Hindu is itself a geographical term. It's mm -hmm. not a religious term. And yet, history has been made to stand on its head with the present government in India, which wants to claim that there was a great grand Hindu civilization that existed forever and all anthropological evidence all genetic evidence in fact now because you know now we have the dna and we can see how people have migrated towards the subcontinent the the the, the results are astonishing mm. and they show that there was an invasion aryan invasion into india that in fact the holy language of Hinduism, mm. Sanskrit, mm. came from Iraq and Mesopotamia. Now that's mind-boggling, you know, because we used to think that, uh, well, the, it was commonly believed that the holy language originated within India and that uh, wisdom has then spread from there but in fact, the story of the human race is that there have been invasions throughout the centuries. We are all children of the same African mother. So, so uh, on, on that front, you know, you're, you're looking at facts. Uh, but today, nationalism is helping to propel India forward economically. And there's great focus on that, and there's energy around it. Do you think that nationalism will fuel India's continued rise, or will it cause issues down the road at some point? Well, it's already causing issues. The way they are modifying their curriculum and the way that they are teaching science is now a bit like, is very much like the way that we in Pakistan are teaching science, where it is forbidden to speak about evolution. <laughs> hmm. And now exactly the same thing is happening in India, but even something that I just read uh, a week ago, it's not only evolution, but it's also the periodic table. Hmm. You know, Mendeleev's periodic table, the classification of elements, they don't want to teach that. Hmm. It's been removed from the curriculum. Why on earth are they doing that? Because they want to stress uh, achievements of ancient hmm. Indian civilization. Hmm. And so in the process, they're willing to distort history just the same way as we have, mm. and they might even go uh, overboard on that. Who knows? Well, so so we. So you see, it's it's not me who's just angry. Mm. I think people in Ing in India are bloody angry. Okay. A lot of anger to go around. So, but we in we are in the U.S. and the U.S. is counting on India's rise to counter China, and China is seen as an adversary. Do you think India will be able to fulfill that role? W um, well, ge geopolitics changes from 
year from decade to decade the US is certainly trying to have India as a counterweight um, but I think India and China have a good chance of working out their differences mm -hmm. in fact um, it's very interesting you know the conflict that they have in the Himalayas they don't fire guns at each other like we mm -hmm. and Pakistan and India we actually use guns we use uh, artillery Fortunately, now that's less these days. But in the Himalayas, there's, a, there's an agreement where they don't use weapons. They actually box each other. They wrestle each other to the ground. They may, they may even throw stones, but there's no ammunition that is being used over there. So on, so on that front, it seems that Pakistan is being self-destructive in so many ways. Uh, and that's probably not a surprise to anybody. So there's a 2,000 mile border with India, but yet there's no trade. And who suffers at the end of the day? It's Pakistani citizens. Uh, there is a, a very strong relationship with China, and China has a strong relationship with the progressive Arab countries and even with Israel. But Pakistan cannot participate in these relationships because of preconceived notions. At what now India and China, as you pointed out, have an adversarial relationship, but they trade with each other. Uh, so trade and geopolitics do not merge in many countries in, in their equation, but it does in Pakistan's case. Uh, why is that, and at what point do you see that changing? You're absolutely correct that between uh, China and India, there's a trade. There's a huge trade. I don't recall the figure, but it's something like $150 billion. But yet they box. They box. They on box. The, yeah. They box mm -hmm. and they'll, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. okay. We have zero trade with India. Mm. We have some trade with China, but it's, um, it's mostly Chinese finished goods coming into Pakistan and Pakistani mangoes, and uh, things that, agricultural products and uh, cotton, et cetera, which is exported into China. Now, since you've mentioned China, I must say there's a troubling aspect to this relationship, which comes from the BRI, Belt Road Initiative, mm -hmm. or CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic, uh, what is it, yeah. Corridor. Mm -hmm. Today, we owe China, $30 billion for constructing roads and power stations, grids, and so forth. Now, the theory was that this would lead Pakistan to hugely increase its industrial production, that this would lead to the creation of new jobs, of new industries, of um, Pakistanis being employed by Chinese companies mm -hmm. in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. None of this has panned out. CPEC is in bad trouble. The Chinese are now wanting their money back. And so um, since Pakistan's coffers are empty, they've had to reschedule the debt. Things are not going well in that regard. And uh, I think now that um, Pakistan may have, have to pay a very big price, which is lease out the port of Gwadar, which is at the edge of the Arabian Sea or the Persian Gulf, whichever you want to call it, and uh, let the Chinese use it as a military <coughs> facility. The earlier thought that Gwadar would be a port just like Dubai is, mm -hmm. nothing like that. I was there actually some uh, uh, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And there's one ship that comes by every two days. Hmm. The place is empty. So, so let's go back uh, to why the U.S. And, and, and I guess the world, but I'll pick the U.S. because that's where we are right now. Why should the U.S. care about Pakistan other than the fact that it has 240 million people that are in trouble? Uh, I mean, nuclear weapons is one obvious factor, and you know we can talk about whether that's something that needs to be actively uh, an issue. Uh, the second is, as you mentioned, China. Uh, there's a US-China adversarial situation. And third is whether it could handicap India's rise. Uh, any thoughts as to 
whether these three are the major areas or whether and what you think about them? Yes, in geopolitics, one hedges one's bets. And so certainly the U.S. does not want to cut off with Pakistan. Pakistan is 250 million people. It's got, um, let's say, between um, 180 and 240 nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. more than India has, in fact. It uh, could be, it could once again become a hot spot for terrorism mm. because now what we've seen is for one the government is shaky economic collapse is on the horizon the Taliban from Afghanistan are now intruding into Pakistan through the organization known as the TTP which is the Pakistani Taliban and it could become extreme to the point that once again from here terrorism could radiate outwards. Now I don't see that as imminent but this is what the United States should rightly be worried about uh, and of course um, the, the Chinese see Pakistan also in geopolitical terms they see it as a way to, to control the rise of India to make sure that it doesn't move anywhere to the west, that is. And um, yeah, every country's got its own little thing to do. do. Do you think it's fair to say that the Chinese and the Pakistanis, culturally, there's less of a fit than between the Pakistanis and the west? Oh, I think there's no comparison. In spite of the fact that Chinese is now taught in some private schools in Pakistan, uh, kids don't don't learn it. And there are no Chinese have, in the streets. We have, hmm. the, the Chinese are so afraid of coming into the public uh, because they feel that um, someone, it could be an ethnic group, it could be a religious group hmm. that wants to kill them. And in fact, there have been some uh, terrible incidents like uh, at Karachi University where a suicide bomber hmm. who was Baloch killed uh, the Chinese instructors, language instructors. And when I went to Gwadar, what I saw was uh, the Chinese live in a colony over there, and you don't see a single Chinese anywhere in the city itself. Now, that's very unfortunate because the Chinese are nice people. You know, I, uh, th this is not what should happen to any national of any country, that he or she should feel under threat. But yes, they do feel threatened. So let's talk for about education because I know you're passionate about it in science education. What's going on uh, with education in Pakistan and and I guess compare it to India. You mentioned that India is going in the wrong direction now. It was in the right direction before and Pakistan has been consistently in the wrong direction. Do you see hope? Oh there's always hope because without hope uh, everybody's dead you know. But. Uh, Look, um, things in education have gone terribly wrong in Pakistan. We have made education a vehicle for propaganda, mm -hmm. for, for creating a mental mindset which uh, rejects science. Mm -hmm. Now, rationality and science uh, go together. Without one, you can't have the other. And oh, what hap what's happened particularly in the years that Imran Khan was there was that the direction of education was turned around from the little bit of uh, secular rational thinking that could be taught over there. The madrasas and the schools were linked together and it was said that this would be a single national curriculum that it would uplift the madrasas and bring the schools just a little bit down maybe but it will level the playing field for everybody sounded really good but what what this has ended up doing is that the madrasas have rejected it well they say we'll think about it five years later on the other hand the schools now teach what was earlier taught in madrasas, mm -hmm. what is taught in madrasas. Mm -hmm. So the schools have been 
brought down to the level of the madrasas, which means that it's it's the Quran which they have to learn by heart. It's the hadith, which is the life of the Prophet and his sayings, which they must now also learn. And in addition to this, the number of prayers that they must memorize, it just kills the mind. I can certainly see that. So let me switch in terms of the mind. Uh, let's look at brain power and innovation and entrepreneurship, because we're in Silicon Valley. Uh, Indians and Pakistanis and other ethnic groups tend to cooperate here and then build links to their home country. So there's great interest. Uh, there has been for a long time among Indians in Silicon Valley in seeing India's rise, and that's been terrific to see. Uh, there's also an interest in among Pakistanis in Silicon Valley in seeing Pakistan rise. Uh, when I was in, in uh, visiting Pakistan, I went to a university called LUMS and was very impressed with their facilities, and I met some of their professors. And over here, from time to time, I meet entrepreneurial groups uh, from Pakistan, and they are just as creative as, uh, on an individual basis, just as enthusiastic, I should say, rather than creative. What prospects do you see for the high-tech industry, such as it is in Pakistan, to get somewhere and to build bridges that could potentially lift at least a part of the population up? I am aware of a couple of bridges here in Silicon Valley between Indians and Pakistanis, and I think that's a great idea mm -hmm. because we are made from the same genetic material. In fact, you know, I talked about DNA earlier. What's absolutely marvelous is that today I can give my, I, you can, or anyone can give their DNA material to a lab and find out one's ancestry, going back to I don't know how many generations. But that DNA sample will not tell you whether that person is a Hindu or a Muslim. <laughs> and so we have the same genetic material. Mm -hmm. the, the difference really comes about because of what I talked about earlier, that the, the, at the time of partition, there were far many more Hindus who were in academics, mm -hmm. who were educated, and that gave them a flying start. Now, that difference has increased and increased, and uh, well, you'll have to think of ways to bridging that gap, but it cannot be bridged until we change Pakistan's educational system. Mm -hmm. So uh, other Muslim-majority countries seem to be progressing in that direction. So in the Middle East, um, the Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries, uh, they're trying very hard to invest their petrodollars into brain power, uh, into universities and so forth. Malaysia has been trying for a while. Indonesia is rising. Bangladesh, which used to be East Pakistan, is doing relatively well on that front as well. Why, why is Pakistan, on the relative basis, lagging? And can and should these countries do something to help? And why isn't Pakistan seeking to build constructive, productive links? If you're looking at this canvas of 45 Muslim countries, you'll see that some are mm -hmm. uh, going towards modernity. Mm -hmm. And Saudi Arabia and UAE are examples of that. Interestingly, it's not happening because of um, a demand from below mm -hmm. to achieve this, but because there are autocrats in power who say, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. In the case of Pakistan, um, unf because of this, because of um, accidents of history, we were aligned differently. Mm -hmm. We had General Ziaul Haq who came in 1977 and stayed until 1988 and in the process changed the mindset of the entire nation through educational programming. That has not been reversed and must be if we are ever to get out and be like a normal country. So in your book you talk about the path forward and you outline several steps that must be taken that you believe should be taken to move in the right direction. 
Um, and I noted a couple of them that, that I'd like for you to explain a little bit. You say end legalized discrimination. What does that mean? It means that discrimination is written into the Constitution, that a Muslim and a non-Muslim are to be treated differently. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of padding that, yeah, you must be nice to non-Muslims. That's not the point. The point is that a citizen of a country will owe allegiance to that country only if he or she is considered at par with anybody else. So like all men are created equal, perhaps, like the Absolutely. US? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, it, it should be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. So Pakistani should become, Pakistan should become more like the US. That's, I, I, I agree with that. I can't argue well, with that. The US has its problems, but this is a good principle. So in terms of divergence then, I mean, is India, could India sign up to that now? India has had signed up to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. back in the days of Jawaharlal Nehru. Mm -hmm. Now, under the rise of Hindu fundamentalism, it is deviating from that. And it is, in fact, weakening itself mm -hmm. by doing so. Because the strength of a country relies upon diversity, upon how you give opportunities to all those who live within it. And the United States is such a brilliant example of that. After World War II, all the best scientists of Europe anywhere in the world. They came and they were, I mean, if you look at all the big names in science and physics, uh, they were Germans, they were Jews, they were from all over the world. They were Indians, some, and that's, you see, humans progress mm -hmm. when their genetic pools mix, mm -hmm. when their societies become diverse, pluralistic. Mm -hmm. And that should be the goal of every society. Aspirational equality, which leads to another, another recommendation you made, which is uncage the women. Could you, could you expand on that? Yes. The woman in Pakistan is in a physical cage. That is the burqa. Mm -hmm. If you go to Peshawar, if you go to the uh, tribal areas, it is that. And it has expanded into the cities. I, all right, fine. If a woman really likes to be in burqa, we let her. She should be. She should have the right. But to force them is wrong. The the, the dress of women has changed enormously over the last forty years. You know, when I started teaching in my university fifty years ago, there was only one young woman in a burqa and it was rumored that she was Ahmadi but we let that pass. Today when I teach a class in that university I uh, I cannot see um, except for a few a normal woman. Mm -hmm. So, so to switch to the, your other recommendation, you said cool down Kashmir. Now, I've been in several conferences where on the Indian side they say stop terrorism, on the Pakistani side they say Kashmir. So it seems to be an impasse, two sides talking about two different things. What do you mean by cool down Kashmir? Okay, terrorism from the Pakistani side has stopped, uh, so far as I can see. It used to be visible and apparent. Something like, uh, well, before 9-11. After 9-11, it went underground. Now, under the pressure of the Federal, uh, of the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, it's, it's no longer there, so far as I can see. Okay, so that's not the issue now. Kashmir is is a matter that cannot be resolved through force. The Indians have nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons. We know that a conventional war between the two will rapidly escalate into a nuclear confrontation and that's something that neither country can afford. That is, that is... Uh... And so there's only one solution to Kashmir which is let the border be porous, let divided families reunite, let there be trade, and then over time, things will somehow, hopefully, resolve themselves.
So in cannot the in be done the way India wants it or the way Pakistan wants. So in the interest of time, let me ask you one last question, and then we'll turn to audience questions. And my last question to you is: What is a black hole, and what is the black hole? <laughs> A black hole can be formed from a and, dead and very star. Quickly, when, very quickly. When, when, so you asked me for the, for the physical black hole, okay? When well, gravity well, becomes so intense that nothing can leave it, including light itself. Everybody knows that these days. <laughs> okay. But the black hole is a little initiative that I started in Islamabad. It's a, a library. It's a, a laboratory for kids where they play with science toys so that they get enthused into science, into problem solving. And there are lectures every day. And they could be on any issue related to science, art, or culture. We have dance, we have music, we have drama, we have uh, talks about um, Feynman, his physics, about Abdus Salam, about, well, practically everything under the sun, including the James Webb and, and, and I think yeah. you also are able to accept donations from the U.S. You have a 501c3, if I remember correctly. On that front, let me You're ask, a smart one. <laughs> let me, let you, me turn... You said what I wanted to say, but okay, good. So I'll... <laughs> moving to audience questions. If Pakistan continues on its current trajectory, where do you see Pakistan in 10 years? This trajectory cannot continue. There's economic collapse, which is, I'd say, 100% certain. So therefore, it has to change track. And now we are at a point where we really cannot see the future. It is so muddied. Uh, there are events happening every day. We don't know whether there'll be a, a Burmese, a, a Myanmar type of army takeover or whether we'll have elections and uh, the army will con continue to rule from, uh, from the shadows. Mm. I would certainly prefer that to a Myanmar-type solution. Mm. At this moment, 10 years in advance, I will not commit. OK, so some um, quick questions um, in the interest of time. Is there a role for Pakistani expats in the future of Pakistan, and what specific suggestions and cautions do you have for Pakistani expats? I think they need to follow events in the country. They need to support educational ventures. They need to bring their expertise in whatever way they can. And I know that there are startups in Pakistan, not very many of them, but uh, they have now substantially benefited from expat knowledge in the United okay. States. Two countries in the last century were created on religion, on the basis of religion, Israel and Pakistan. Are there any analogies here to explore? Yeah, uh, it was Muslim identity which created Pakistan. It was Jewish identity which created Israel. But the, the difference is that Israel was a Zionist state, but it was a secular Zionist state. Ben-Gurion did not ever envisage um, that it would be a Jewish religious state. These were persecuted Jews, persecuted by Hitler, wanting a place where they could be together. And for at least the first few decades of Israel's ex existence, it was uh, the Orthodox had very little role right. in running. And actually, ben today they want to take over the education system in Israel. So are there similarities? So Ben Gurion, I understand, was an atheist, and Jinnah was not particularly religious either. So, in terms of starting these religious or the, these countries for religious minorities, both founders didn't really adhere to the religion they were seeking to. Support. Yeah, but sir. Ben Gurion was the head of the Histadrut, the, mm. um, uh, the, the labor union. Mm. He was a socialist, committed to the benefit of his people. Jinnah was thoroughly anti-communist, thoroughly anti-socialist, and um, so were the other people in the Muslim League. And therefore, we never had land reform. How you run a country is extremely important in terms of in terms of administration. And that's where um, 
Israel was head and shoulders above Palestine. So in terms of land reform, one of my observations when I went there three months ago is that everybody's investing in land and property, but nobody's investing in the brain power industries. A quick comment about that? Oh, because the returns are so enormous. You can now buy land, or at least, okay, now, now things are changing. You know, that's why I'm not predicting anything. I don't know what's coming next. But two years ago, if you could, if you bought something for, let's say, a, a hundred rupees, six months later, you could sell it for a hundred and ten. A year later, you could sell it for a hundred and thirty or so forth. And the returns were enormous. In contrast, if you set up an industry, well, it may or may not work. So these are guaranteed virtually. So, so that will continue, you think, for a while? Uh, now it's a different story, yeah. Okay. How safe is it for Americans to visit Pakistan? Um, I think it's, uh, it's okay. okay. There are not many Americans to be seen, um, but uh, certainly many like to visit the mountains and the beautiful um, places where I mean, they're very challenging. Uh, the Himalayas, after all, the uh, Hindu Kush are very challenging mountains. So mountaineering is very popular with American mm -hmm. tourists. So he here's the question that's interesting. What are your thoughts on reunification? I assume that the uh, questioner says India and Pakistan reunite and we are back again to uh, not pre-1947. OK. so. I met the president of India in his office, and he asked me this question about reunification. <laughs> this was uh, Abdul Kalam. Uh, I, I thought he meant India-Pakistan, but he wanted to know about the unification of the forces. You know, the <laughs> weak, weak electromagnetic gravity, <laughs> strong. I first filled him in on that, and then I said, sir, what we need to do is have academic exchange between our countries. I was sort of lukewarm on that. But uh, reunification of India and Pakistan, absolutely not. Not possible. Mm -hmm. The Indians don't want it. The Pakistanis don't want it. We have to learn to live with each other, but we live separately. OK. So uh, you mentioned that, that you know, you're hopeful about the future because one has to be. So this questioner asks, uh, you create a very dismal picture of the future for Pakistan. Where can we find hope? Uh, so uh, in the discussion that we've had so far, this particular individual doesn't think there's much hope. Yeah. Well, because he's been reading the newspapers and he's been reading the op-eds and um, yeah, things are bad. I mean, um, inflation is now 50% a year. There's uh, only enough dollars left uh, to cover the next two weeks of exports. So all that is pretty grim. Plus, there are other challenges. I mean, uh, I have them listed, in, uh, listed, I discuss them in the book. There's climate change, there's a population growth that's out of control. So all of these are things that one should worry about. But look, things have looked matters have looked very grim in the past. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought during World War II that the world would survive? And yet, everything then uh, eventually fixed itself. Mm -hmm. This might be a harder problem, but uh, let's leave it up to human ingenuity to figure out solutions. Mm -hmm. By the way, on the subject of your book, I think you've organized it very well. You've pulled together facts, you have great, uh, great research, and you've done it in a very compelling way. So I read it recently, and I actually found myself, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't use the word enjoying it, but I found, I, found, I found that I was learning a lot from it. It was clarifying a lot of what I saw, uh, and what I knew, and some of what I thought I knew, but didn't really know. Um, so back to questions. Um, could the U.S.-China conflict play out as a proxy war between India and Pakistan? Um, not really. I don't think Pakistan now is in a position to have any kind of um, military dueling with uh, China. It's um, now in a position of retreat. And um, 
the indians are not um they're not militarily attacking pakistan or making aggressive moves so they are just waiting and watching and they're quite satisfied with the way things have turned out for pakistan mm -hmm. after all their adversary is now r being run to the ground without their having to do anything so i don't see that happening immediately so on on the other side you know three months ago as i mentioned i visited pakistan and i had a great time uh, the airports are new getting through is easy the highways are modern uh, the streets are unlittered there are no beggars there are great restaurants so i had sushi in lahore which is a thousand miles from any water uh, and it was fresh and it was delicious so uh, and i kept reading about elite capture and uh, i found myself thinking uh, you know it doesn't sound like a bad thing if this is what it delivers talk a little bit about elite capture and talk a little bit about how that keeps things going the way they are and and why that should change you know while the world's uh, attention was focused on the floods a third of pakistan is under water people are in desperate circumstances well people ha were having sushi mm -hmm. in islamabad and in lahore not all of them there's a huge amount of poverty in islamabad in fact uh, all i have to do is uh, go to a, go a couple of streets down from my house and it's hard rending when you see kids eating out of garbage <laughs> Um, but those floods um it's good for the getting money from the international community but in fact we didn't care for them see this is what this is the heartless nature of elites they look only at themselves they only care about themselves and and do you see that changing oh, we'll make a change okay it it has to so it so, has to come so and and there are progressive forces in pakistan not strong but in time they will grow well so on and, that and and they that sentiment has to be captured before the religious people capture it so on, on that front uh, when when an institution is insolvent usually outsiders have a bigger role and one of the earlier questions was what can overseas pakistanis do what can global institutions banks and so forth do fix things because the way it is now uh, uh, is even if somebody wrote a big check it would be back to business as usual fairly soon so how can the structure be influenced by people who are not inside but outside with more power than they had before good question um you have to be very discriminatory in what you give to who mm -hmm. so you know people are very um, against the imf but and and i too have been um but now i have a sort of a soft spot for them because they saying that you can't uh give subsidies to the rich and to the poor equally you cannot make the price for example the price of petrol stay uh, below uh, that that the price of petrol be artificially lowered because the rich will be taking will be using more for their suvs uh what you need to do is have a set of subsidies of subsidies that can accurately uh discriminate between this and that so no general sales tax GST is is a tax for everybody so somebody who buys um something from the market well the poor and the rich pay the same that's not right in terms of individuals well i think there are good organizations in pakistan and you need to follow how those organizations are doing what they are doing and then depending on your own preferences you donate here or there so we have just a few seconds and one last question what is the possibility of initiating a critical discourse around religion in pakistan um the chances are very small it uh, i i think if you bring up the subject of a religion 
um, that will always go towards majoritarianism. The Shias don't want to talk about religion, rightly. The Zikris, the Ismailis, the Boras, they don't want to talk. These are small subsects of Islam. They would prefer to be um, not known, less known. And so there's no urgent need to talk about that. But what we do need to do is get as much religion out of the school curriculum as possible. Well said. Our thanks to Parvez Hoodboy for this stimulating discussion. We also thank our audience here for your thoughtful questions and also the online audience. You're welcome to stay and speak with him for a while. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California in its 121st year of enlightened discussion is adjourned. <laughs> Good.